Hello. Um, so I don't hear anything, but I think that's normal. It's the first time that I've been doing a web webinar. Um, from the chats, I see that you're here. And uh, can you hear me? I see yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, I try to follow the chat at the same time as I'm talking. And um, I will present myself. I'm Johannes Engelmuller. I'm a specialist of discourse studies. Um, I'm German by um, uh, birth. I've been living in the UK for about seven years. And um, I did my PhD in France um, about 20 years ago. No, um, 16 years ago. And um, so I've had an interest in political discourses for my job. I do research and discourse research. And um, I've come to have some sort of, sort of personal interest in discourses around anti-Semitism. I should say that I have no real um, qualification in talking about um, anti-Semitism. I know there are lots of much more specialized people. Uh, there's a lot of research that I don't know. Um, there are lots of history about um, uh, Jews, um, Jewish history, Israel, that I don't know. So I'm sure that some of you know about these things much better than I do. And the one little thing that might be interesting for, for you is to have a comparative look at some of the developments that we have seen over the last few years. Um, in fact, uh, when I grew up, anti-Semitism was not a real issue in the sense that, um, I mean, everybody was, I mean, absolutely 100% um, um, agreed on, on um, anti-Semitism being bad. Of course, this is still the case, but there was never any real conflict or some sort of real question to ask people what they really mean and what they um, what they think about certain things in terms of anti-semitism and um, so in effect um, the question of anti-semitism has become much more prevalent over the last I would say five to ten years and um, the interesting thing is that uh, we have seen this um, in different countries and um, there's some parallels, also some differences, but there's some interesting parallels in terms of a discourse around anti-Semitism that I think is perhaps um, important if you want to understand um, the question, the, the global phenomenon of anti-Semitism more, more, more generally. Can you follow? Okay, the sound quality is fine. Okay, good. Um, I have no idea what it's like because I just hear myself, which is a, an interesting experience. Um, okay. Um, let me say perhaps um, a few words about um, the terms that we're using. In fact, I had suggested to name the title of this talk Discourses of Anti-Semitism and not Anti-Semitic Discourses because I think it's not easy, um, and perhaps a question which is different, um, it's not easy to define what is anti-Semitic and who is anti-Semitic. We definitely see a rise of anti-Semitism discourses, but the question of who really is anti-Semitic is a much more specific and a much more controversial question, of course. So, um, I think we should um, distinguish between discourses of anti-Semitism, and that's definitely something which has risen, and uh, we should also think about anti-Semitic discourses, that is, discourses where certain people turn out to be anti-Jewish or um, extend, prolong certain prejudices against um, Jewish groups. And that's, um, that's in fact a, a quite um, important difference. Um, I, I would think that of course we have both discourses um, in our political uh, world. Uh, we have anti-Semites, 
um, who spread hate um, against uh, groups, especially against, uh, against Jews. Um, but we also have discourses about anti-Semitism, where people try to reflect on who exactly is against Jews, and does not just uh, about certain questions like um, uh, taking a stance in, in certain conflicts in, in, in the Middle East, for example. Um, and um, so what, what I'd like to do in this talk is to kind of, um, um, in a way, um, talk about that space where, of course, both go together. It's very diff difficult to separate both. And um, I, I also would like to say that um, um, there are different degrees of um, anti-Semitic discourses. And, um, and I guess um, there are some groups where um, the anti-Jewish um, identity is very important and um, they use an explicit strategy to whip up hate against um, uh, Jews. That's uh, the case um, for certain political movements, uh, which have played a very important role. Um, um, in Germany, for, of course, uh, there's um, a tradition of anti-Semitism um, from, for example, um, Richard Wagner uh, in the 19th century to um, Adolf Hitler. Um, this is something that um, that was very important um, in, in preparing the um, uh, the um, the Shoah, uh, the um, uh, the genocide of, uh, of, uh, of of Jews in Europe, and um, and of course there's no way that we can understand Hitler and um, the political movement that he represents without the hate against Jews. Now that's uh, one type of anti-Semitism in my kind of very kind of naive view perhaps. Um, I I'm sure there are other people who have uh, worked on that uh, more systematically, but just to kind of uh, give you some sort of um, idea about um, uh, what I try to talk about. And um, it's something that we all need, need to talk about together. Um, there are also um, uh, political movements where there's some sort of tropes about Jews, which are critical of Jews, which can be considered as anti-Semitic. But uh, the difference uh, with uh, the first group where anti-Semitism is really used to whip up hate strategically to, um, to win elections, for example. Um, in the second group, it's much more like um, an implicit thing that comes along with other things. And, um, and in fact, um, it is either kind of um, hidden so that people understand um, the kind of um, anti-Semitic contents, or it is more like um, a kind of minor thing that is not that important for the political identity of those um, of those political movements, but it comes along with it. So, of course, today um, that's much more um, widespread. Um, I can't really see of that many groups where anti-Semitism is used as an explicit strategy. It's in many cases uh, much more implicit and sometimes um, not a great um, major part of the political ideology. And um, that's, of course, something which is um, very dangerous because uh, people can't, can't be really held responsible for, for their discourses. And in many cases, they play with it um, and they don't really um, uh, um, accept um, that, uh, that some of uh, what they say can be understood in ways uh, which uh, others um, perceive as um, prejudice against um, uh, against Jews. And then, of course, there's um, a, a third group of discourses where discourses about anti-Semitism, about Jews, about Israel are used in ways so that they're recontextualized um, and and given new meanings. And, and that's the kind of... Um, accidental anti-Semitism, perhaps. Um, I don't know. Um, um, there might be lots of discourses about um, anti-Semitism where um, things are interpreted and reinterpreted and misinterpreted. And at some point, um, some things um, after longer processes 
um, are perceived to be anti-Semitic or not, without uh, there being um, um, a real source of, of, of these discourses. Um, so these are different um, ways of talking about anti-Semitism. And um, I think um, uh, the problem, of course, is that, um, that, that these things are usually mixed together. And especially uh, the second and the third group, um, the more implicit and the more accidental ways of talking about anti-Semitism. Okay, um, is it possible to follow me? If, um, if you have any reactions, uh, just use chat so that I know that, um, um, that there's something that, um, that uh, we should elaborate perhaps on. It's a rather one-directional one thing here, since um, I, I just hear myself and you hear me. So um, let's try to, um, to make sure it's, um, it's a productive um, event here. So um, when, when we talk about anti-Semitism in the three countries um, today, um, over the last uh, few years, I think it's important to um, um, to understand that some of these things, of course, um, are not really controlled by one particular group, or uh, lots of these things happen uh, because lots of people talk together, and um, and sometimes they do things um, they're really not aware of, and uh, sometimes they are very much aware of. Um, and um, it's important to kind of um, um, talk about what is really problematical together. And I don't want to be in, in a position to define certain things um, as anti-Semitic, um, even though, um, of course, um, there are definitely degrees uh, of, of uh, what is uh, problematical and what's perhaps less problematical. So what uh, what I really want to focus on uh, in the next um, 45 minutes, or perhaps uh, perhaps at the most 60 minutes, is to, to, to talk about some experiences in the rise of anti-Semitic discourses um, over the last five to, let's say, 20 years at the most, in three countries, in France, in the UK, and in Germany. And uh, what we can see over that period, uh, especially over the last five period, uh, five years, is um, a rise in certain things which are um, unsettling in terms of um, um, the way that um, that Jews are treated. Um, uh, some Jews are, feel and perceive certain acts and certain discourses um, in. In the public discourses in these countries and in, in the three languages um, it's quite different um, uh, public spheres because of the different languages and um, and what we can see for example in many of these countries is a rise of people uh, of jewish people um, who say they're considering emigration to israel um, there's a rise of um, anti-semitic acts of violence and um, uh, hate speech. Uh, we're talking about a um, um, few thousands of these incidents, not one hundreds of thousands. Um, it is difficult to know whether these um, incidents um, represent um, a real um, development, um, because of course uh, sometimes it becomes much easier to um, to report these things to the police when there are some discourses about anti-Semitism or about racism. Uh, these things are reported much more easily. However, um, there's, some, um, there's some evidence um, that in these three countries, people um, from Jewish descent feel less secure. And that's, of course, um, a very um, unsettling development, uh, given that um, there has been um, 1,000 1, years of um, persecution um, um, in history um, in Europe um, of, of Jews. And um, it is quite surprising to, to me and to many other people um, um, who observe these discourses to see um, that kind of um, atmosphere, in a way, 
uh, coming back. And um, I think what is really important to understand these things is to think about and to consider the rise of a so-called populist left. Uh, uh, this is a reconfiguration of the political landscape um, in these um, in these countries, which is not only limited to these countries. I mean, of course, we have um, seen similar developments in the US, um, perhaps in Latin America. Um, I don't know about uh, Russia, which is um, a much more authoritarian government where there's no real kind of um, open um, and uh, democratic debate. Um, so what we have over the last few years is, a, um, is an explosion in a way of the classic uh, binary divide between the left and the right, um, where on the left you have a kind of um, moderate social democratic party, which uh, leads um, a broad alliance of groups um, up to the far left sometimes. And on the right, you have a respectable um, conservative um, um, party or movement um, who, uh, in a way, uh, comprise uh, liberal, economically liberal, up to um, some far right and um, uh, socially conservative um, 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 groups. And um, over the last five years, of course, as uh, I'm sure all of you are aware, that kind of divide, that kind of division between um, the two respectable uh, left and right parties um, has been in a crisis. And, um, and uh, as a result, um, there has been an explosion of um, the um, kind of moderate centrist um, social democrats in many countries, not in all the countries, but um, in these three countries, uh, they don't really um, exist anymore. And um, to some degree, uh, a bit more recently, um, I would say over the last three years since the election of Trump, um, a very similar phenomenon has, um, has been observed um, for the right. So um, the classical um, respectable conservative parties, um, they're in a crisis. And that's especially the case um, in, in the UK and in France, um, where the um, right-wing uh, Le Pen, uh, Front National Party, um, what, what are they called now? Um, they, um, they have overtaken the classical Gaullists, um, which, um, which were very important up to Sarkozy, which was the uh, president before Hollande. And, um, and now the, uh, the right um, uh, spectrum in France is, uh, is led by, um, by the uh, extreme right-wing parties. Um, in the UK, um, the situation is slightly different because the Tory party has become um, a kind of extreme right-wing party. Um, it is not um, the same as uh, Le Pen, I would say, um, at, uh, as, as uh, the right-wing party in, in France, since um, it has developed out of a bourgeois um, kind of um, um, experienced governmental, um, governmental experienced party. Uh, but over the last uh, uh, few years with Brexit, it has become um, a very dogmatic and ideologically driven um, um, a factionist uh, party, which, which is very much um, um, committed to, to nationalist um, and right-wing project. It's much more liberal um, than the right-wing people in um, France and also in Germany. But it shares the nationalism and, to some degree, uh, the xenophobia and, um, and the hate of, of immigrant groups um, that we can see um, uh, in many groups of the right. And um, in Germany, um, the process has been a bit less um, extreme. Um, the um, classical um, Christian Democrats, which are the classical conservatives, have been very centrist in comparison to their um, equivalents in, Germany, in France and the UK and in the US and many other countries. Uh, the CDU under Merkel has become a very um, um, moderate um, centrist party with lots of liberal elements, uh, pro-immigration and um, pro-European, certainly pro-European. And, um, and so uh, there's a new party, the Alternative for Deutschland, 
uh, which in a way uh, continues the um, um, old extreme right-wing traditions, um, perhaps even some Nazi elements, uh, which um, which had been um, organized by the NPD, the National Party of, of, of Germany, uh, before um, until a few years ago. And so there has been a, a kind of um, a rise of, of a far extreme right-wing party over the last few years, but they're very far away from from taking over power. Nobody uh, wants to deal with them. And of course, in order to get to power, they would need 50% um, uh, uh, and, and more in the elections, which um, is still a very um, long way to go. Uh, this is different in, in France, where there's a real chance uh, for the Front National to take over at some point, and the name now is um, Les Républicains. No. I oh, I forgot the um, the new name that they that they've chosen, and um, and of course in, in Great Britain, um, the right wing Tory party is a, a, in power, and uh, so it's very much a reality of um, of who has um, who controls institutions and um, and has a, a good presence in the media. Okay. Ah, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Julie Marie. Uh, this is Rassemblement, Rassemblement National uh, in France. Okay, are you following? Should I continue? Is the uh, lagging okay? Okay, so I will go on. Um, if there's a problem with the lag, perhaps we can uh, turn off the camera and um, um, uh, I think my internet should be fine even though I had some problems uh, last week. Um, yeah, let me know if, if there's a problem with, um, with the lag. Okay, so um, what what I find is really interesting in, in the debates around anti-Semitism over the last um, few years is that um, the main new um, controversies around anti-Semitism have been associated with the, um, with the new populist left um, that has dominated um, the left spectrum in, 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 in these countries, at least in France, and in the UK, um, in in the UK, uh, Jeremy Corbyn took over. I think four years ago, he was elected the leader of the Labour Party. Um, quite surprisingly, um, Labour had been a centrist um, social democratic party, uh, which had continued the heritage of Blair, uh, who was prime minister for a long time, ten years. Um, and um, and Gordon Brown and um, there was a crisis of the new labor project um, um, especially since um, the Iraq war that was um, um, triggered by by Blair and Bush and uh, that was uh, based on, um, on wrong um, information on lies and um, and there are other developments uh, an increasing uh, criticism of the inequality in society, um, a discourse about the one percent against the ninety-nine percent, and um, and when when Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party, there was right away um, a few articles about him having a, a kind of strange role in terms of of um, of his his stance on on Israel and the Jews. And there were some, um, but very um, um, few articles about him um, being um, kind of um, a danger uh, in terms of um, uh, for, for, for the Jewish community um, because he was uh, positive about um, the Hezbollah and, um, and uh, he consistently um, took the, the, the sides of the Palestinians um, in the conflict. Um, that uh, became um, uh, very violent, uh, especially since the second Intifada, uh, which began, I think, in 2000. So um, Jeremy Corbyn uh, was um, active. Um, 
he took sides and he was explicit vocal in these debates um, for a long time. Um, this didn't come as a big surprise to um, most observers because um, Jeremy Corbyn had been very vocal in all kinds of post-colonial struggles in the world. And um, by 2015, by the mid, mid uh, tens of, it, uh, of the 2000s, um, it had been quite some something common among people from the left um, who had been involved in, in struggles against imperialism um, uh, to take the sides of the oppressed groups, of course, that was always a, a very important identity issue of the left, um, especially on, on the far, far left. And uh, it was um, uh, part and parcel of, um, of um, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, heritage uh, and um, uh, his, um, his project to, to support um, um, the, the, the oppressed groups in, 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 in not only in Palestine, but in many uh, areas in the world. And now over the last few years, um, there has been more and more criticism um, of the way that he formulates his um, uh, stance on, on the Jewish question, on anti-Semitism, on Israel. And, um, and I think um, there are two things. One thing is that there have been some, some revelations. Um, there was, for example, um, um, the Daily Mail found out that he uh, lay a wreath uh, um, and if he honored um, um, Palestinians in the Palestinian uh, cemetery of Tunis, um, North Africa. And that was very close to those who killed the um, Israel as athletes in Munich in 2000, 1972. And um, he reacted in ways which were strange because um, he, he said um, when he was asked uh, by, by, by the reporters um, uh, uh, whether he was aware of that and how he, he deals with uh, the criticism from people who are aware of um, anti-Semitism um, in, 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 in various political movements. He said, well, but, um, but the Israeli government, uh, they, um, they killed people as well. Um, and there was also the revelation of him um, condoning a cartoon, uh, which was clearly um, anti-Semitic. I mean, you saw kind of a group of rich people, uh, bankers, it seems, um, and they had um, the physiognomy of um, the cartoon Jew, right, with, with the big noses and things like that. And um, there was a trace on Facebook um, where he said that this is good art. Um, it's not perhaps uh, very clear whether uh, this really referred to that piece of uh, graffiti or, or art. And, uh, but still it is, um, I mean, there are ongoing questions about, uh, about Corbyn taking um, his stance for the Palestinians and against um, uh, the Israeli government, which has been right wing for, for a long time now. Um, and not seeing that um, there's a broader uh, persecution of um, Jews um, in Europe and um, also in the UK for a long time. And, um, and um, perhaps um, uh, he, he doesn't really kind of um, see that um, the kind of complex questions um, involved, uh, especially when it comes to, to the question of the right of, of Israel as a state to exist, which um, of course has been um, uh, questioned by the radical um, Islamist groups uh, like Hamas, um, who, who, um, who pursue a war against Israel. And um, it's not quite clear whether uh, Corbyn um, supports those factions or not. And um, that's, of course, something which has been hugely controversial. And, uh, and also what is more worrying, perhaps, um, the Corbyn coalition 
which came to power um, in the last few years in Labour and um, took the major positions of, of um, power in, in Labour. Um, there are lots of um, similar cases where people are wondering whether um, uh, whether the way they communicate about uh, Jews is insulting and um, um, their, their, their weird statements, uh, for example, from Corbyn about uh, Jews um, in that room where he was speaking, not understanding uh, humor, uh, the English sense of humor. Um, and so one wonders to some degree whether there's a, um, um, a problem um, in in labor more generally, um, and not just with, with Corbyn. And, uh, and in fact, um, it's been quite uh, striking how, how hard it has been for, for Corbyn to really um, um, distance himself from, from those cases. And it's quite clear that lots of his friends, they share that kind of post-colonial um, discourse about Palestine, about uh, Israel. And in fact, it's a quite important thing for them to be critical of Israel. And, um, and it's, it's difficult for Corbyn to uh, be very uh, strict on them because these are his allies. And, um, and so that's why um, uh, the cases of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic uh, hate speech um, has become really uh, very important over the last few months. Um, there was uh, Ljana Berger, uh, a Labour Jewish MP who left the party um, because of that um, of that problem. And um, the Labour, uh, the Jewish Labour movement, um, um, uh, some of them are pro Corbyn, some of them are very critical and uh, are no longer in support of Labour. And uh, so that really has tarnished um, uh, the reputation. And one, 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 one. I, I I'm wondering uh, why why this is um, so difficult for for the populist um, uh, Corbynist um, uh, Labour strand to um, to be clear on anti-Semitism and to really kind of make sure that that people who pursue these um, uh, anti-Semitic obsessive um, um, hate uh, hate campaigns, why they can't just leave the party, and uh, which is um, committed to anti-racism and um, has a long tradition of um, uh, living together um, in multicultural society. So it's weird that um, um, there's a problem um, with anti-Semitism and um, it's very difficult for them to, to really deal with that. Now, um, the question now is how to deal with that with that problem, and um, and I think it's really important to see that that kind of discourse around anti-Semitism, and also a discourse which sometimes sometimes is anti-Semitic um, in a certain way. It is still very different from the classic um, anti-Semitism discourse, because of course. Um, in all countries, um, in the long term, um, anti-Semitism used to be um, a matter of the right, and it still is. Um, the kind of explicit, um, clearly anti-Semitic um, ideologies, they're very much um, embedded in, in the far right. Um, in the UK, for example, there's the um, uh, British Nationalist Party, uh, which is anti-Semitic, um, and 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 in these right-wing groups, and perhaps even in some Tories, um, it is um, um, a discourse about the nation as being kind of white, having a certain religion that is not Jewish. Um, being committed to to the national project and um, being critical about uh, traitors and uh, the um, the kind of cosmopolitan elite um, that doesn't have attachments. That's kind of um, classic 
um, discourse from the right about uh, Jews, which um, which I think all in all is um, declining. Um, I don't hear about that that much. Um, in the UK, that certainly exists, um, but I don't think it's uh, it's growing. Um, I haven't heard about um, that kind of tropes that much um, in the Tories, um, even though um, we are all aware of the Brexit uh, campaign and there's obsessive hate of the EU and if you have a look at um, how people talk about um, the EU, it is um, really reminiscent of the way that the Nazis talked about the Jews. Um, there's talk about um, uh, the kind of conspiracy, the dictatorship of people who have no attachments, um, who, who are a threat um, to the real uh, Britons, um, and um, there's this kind of um, conspiracy theorist a theory about um, globalist uh, elites, sometimes bankers, um, sometimes um, um, urban metropolitan elites um, who um, conspire against um, the good old uh, uh, British uh, uh, population. And, um, and that, of course, um, the structure of that discourse is not um, that different. You see the same sort of insults like um, comparing the others um, to animals, um, kind of um, um, indulging in the discourse about traitors all the time. Um, so Brexit discourse um, feels very much like um, certain discourse from from the Nazis in the 30s uh, to me um, when I compare that. But I must say it is not primarily against Jews. Um, that That's something which um, I don't really see that much, even though I'm sure you can you can find some examples. And um, so um, so yeah, I was I was um, trying to make the point that we have these two different traditions, um, a kind of more recent discourse about anti-Semitism on the left, which probably goes back to the 60 uh, days war in 1967, when um, uh, the post-colonial leftist um, activists um, um, became critical of uh, Israel, which uh, turned out to be a kind of quite powerful um, military power in the region, and uh, especially during the Second Intifada uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, so there's a new discourse of anti-Semitism that, um, that goes together with, um, with a post-colonial critique of globalization, and which um, is very much committed to taking the side of the oppressed and of the victims. And um, so there's the idea that um, um, Israel and sometimes uh, the Jews are seen as kind of responsible for the state of Israel, um, which is presented as, a, as an imperialist power extending American, North American power um, in the Middle East. And, uh, and sometimes also British power for some uh, for some strange reasons, and um, and so uh, there's a reflex um, among certain post-colonial leftist militants to um, to take a side against Israel, and then sometimes it's very difficult to draw the line between uh, criticizing Israel and um, and uh, and being anti-Semitic. Um, the reason being that, um, of course, um, uh, um, if you talk about um, doing away uh, with the state of Israel, um, it's very difficult to understand how this would not be um, affecting uh, Jews, uh, at least some Jews. Um, and um, and um, I, I find it interesting to see that um, in the left there's very little critical reflection on First of all, why the state of Israel was founded and why it is needed, um, 
and there's not only the Shoah, the um, the Nazi uh, persecution of Jews, but the, there's 1,000 years of persecution of Jews, and um, I think there's some very good reasons why um, uh, the state of Israel is is necessary, and um, and also people have a right to be protected by a state, and everybody I think um, has that right, and so. Um, I um, I think there's an ongoing debate uh, which uh, we need and um, and uh, what we can observe um, from my point of view is some sort of obsessive interest in Israel and a kind of obsessive um, uh, criticism which um, uh, of course um, is very well um, justified if we think of very problematical um, decisions that have been taken by, uh, by especially the right-wing government uh, of, of the last few years in order to, um, to radicalize uh, the conflict. And, um, but, um, but still there are things uh, which, which, uh, which go back further uh, and, and um, I think uh, we need to be very careful not to, um, not to kind of um, create an amalgam between, uh, between these different complex historical questions. Um, I just uh, tried to have a look at uh, some of the comments here. Many thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, there's um, there's um, a discourse on the left which um, normally uh, is not. Um, explicitly against Jews. Um, I think um, there's um, a strong uh, idea, um, um, a universalist idea among leftist militants that uh, nations shouldn't really um, uh, play a major role and that culture uh, should not really lead us to discriminate anybody. Uh, same thing for religion. Of course, there's an anti-religious um, bent in in the kind of classical leftist uh, thinking, and um, and so the question really is to what degree the criticism of Israel, the criticism of um, the Israeli government, um, goes together uh, with a discourse uh, which can be seen as anti-Semitic. And of course, here we really in questions of um, how discourses work and um, how difficult it is really to. Um, to understand what people really mean and intend, because of course, um, in that discourse, nobody will say, and I'm pretty sure that very few people really believe that there's there's a problem with Jews as such. Um, but there's a big problem uh, with creating discourses which resonate with anti-Semitic discourses from the past and from today, and um, and then, um, yeah, people get entangled in these debates, and um, and um, I think um, it is um, it is something that uh, that needs some more reflection. I'm sometimes um, quite um, surprised to see um, a lack of, of reflection, um, and I'm certainly uh, surprised to see how how the Corbyn Labour um, uh, strands have dealt with that uh, over the last few years. Um, yeah, um, so what what I think is important and um, to discuss this with uh, with uh, people, for example, from Labour who um, who don't understand why there's a debate about anti-Semitism, um, I think it's really important to talk with people from the left in a very different way than with people from the right, because um, the left and the right wing discourses work quite differently. And the status and the position of anti-Semitism in those discourses are quite, quite different. Um, uh, perhaps um, we can turn to to ideas about left-right discourses that have put forward by um, George Lakoff. And uh, George Lakoff is a cognitive linguist, and basically he says there are two uh, metaphors, two kind of big 
metaphors that organize left-wing and right-wing discourse. And he says that for, for, for the left-wing discourses, there's the metaphor of the nurturing parent. That is, um, it's a metaphor about uh, organizing society along the lines of a family, which is really kind of um, oriented towards um, nurturing, caring, um, enabling people, helping people, uh, having solidarity, being in harmony with nature. And, um, and so um, for George Lakoff, this is a kind of fundamental metaphor organizing the value system of the left. And the idea basically goes back to, to certain ideas of the family and the way that, um, that a certain type of family can organize society. Whereas it's very different for the right, uh, right-wing discourses are organized by the strict father metaphor. So the strict father um, uh, is usually um, uh, uh, benevolent, uh, so he wants to help too, but in a very different way. It's through order, um, respecting norms, uh, hierarchies, uh, respecting that there's inequality, uh, making sure that uh, there's an inside and an outside of the family, there are strict borders between the inside and the outside, and there's control over nature. It's a, it's a discourse um, that is more kind of, um, let's say, authoritarian um, in some cases. And, um, and so um, here, uh, society is seen according to, to the strict father metaphor, where basically you have um, a homogeneous organic uh, population led by, uh, by, by a strong leader and, um, and, um, and the leader uh, has the power to, um, to impose uh, certain things in the interest of the population. And, uh, and this should be accepted, and that's why you need um, society with inequality between these different groups. And there's also inequality not only uh, between the leader and uh, those who are led, but also between uh, the tribe, the crowd of the leader, and the other crowds. So it's a much more particularistic view of society. Um, it's much less universalistic. And, um, and I think it's important to situate um, the debate around anti-Semitism in these broadly, these two very different um, discourses where uh, people have very different values. And, um, and, and I think um, that's the reason uh, why the left-wing people haven't really understand, uh, understood the discourses around anti-Semitism in the last few years, because they're usually associated with the right-wing discourse and they definitely, uh, they're definitely not right-wing. So um, they, they think it's some sort of conspiracy from, uh, from right-wing newspapers um, and, um, and, uh, and they tend to, to see it as some kind of um, attack uh, from, uh, from the other camp uh, to discredit them. And um, they, they just don't understand um, um, that uh, there's perhaps a different um, a problem with anti-Semitism on, 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 on their side. Yeah, let me just uh, type in uh, the name of George Lakoff. Yeah, George Lakoff is a uh, um, guy from Berkeley. Um, and he had the idea of the nurturing parent versus um, the strict father. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so um, let me go on perhaps and say a few things about the other countries um, because um, um, it's perhaps uh, easiest for, for, for us to follow what's going on in, in an English-speaking country like the UK, where many people outside um, have the capacity to follow um, the discourses because it's, uh, they're in English. And uh, let me say a few things about, um, about uh, discourses around anti-Semitism in France and in Germany. Both countries are, of course, are hugely different um, in, in the way that um, they have treated um, anti-Semitism. And, um, um, and that's, of course, uh, especially because of um, uh, Germany as, um, as the country which uh, persecuted Jews um, uh, under the Nazi regime uh, to, to an incredible 
um, degree of um, final extinction and termination, which was um, the official policy of the German state um, until 1945. And, um, and so um, perhaps if we take um, a broader historical view, um, of course, I mean, we have a long, long, long history uh, starting with the um, kind of religious um, conflicts uh, in, in, in the Middle Ages. Um, but if we go to, to 100 years ago, um, we can see there was um, a strong debate around anti-Semitism in France. And, um, and this was perhaps um, represented by, uh, by the Zola uh, affair, which was um, a big scandal uh, in the public sphere in France around um, um, uh, a writer um, who came up in support of uh, the general Dreyfus. Dreyfus was was, um, was um, a colonel, um, kind of general, who was falsely accused of treason. Um, and um, in the course of that debate, um, it became quite clear that that was uh, unfounded. Uh, he never um, um, worked for the Germans. Um, he, uh, he was falsely accused because uh, it seems uh, because he was Jewish, of Jewish descent. Um, I don't think he was a kind of very practicing Jew, but um, um, that clearly um, played a role. And this led to a very polarized debate um, where basically you had a um, Catholic um, nationalist right on the one hand, and, uh, and they pursued the idea at all costs that uh, Dreyfus had to be judged and trialed um, um, even though there was no evidence. And on the other hand, um, the um, universalistic uh, left in support of the Republic, because at that time it was, I think, around 1900, um, the Third Republic in France was still unsecure, so it was um, um, a democratic uh, republic, uh, which was very much criticized by the mon monarchic uh, right-wing people and Catholics. And, um, and so that affair, which was around that colonel, really kind of um, um, showed the split uh, between um, a kind of right-wing, um, anti-Semitic, um, anti-democratic um, uh, tradition in France, which was still around. And um, they, left, uh, they, they lost um, that debate, uh, finally. It was uh, a bit like Brexit. Um, they really became very much um, polarized and radicalized, um, fan fanatic in a way. And they left and they lost uh, the debate. Um, and it marked the turning point for the French Third Republic. Um, it became clear that after that affair that uh, it would survive and um, it would remain until um, the Second World War when um, the, the kind of liberal um, establishment, um, kind of democratic uh, left and, and, and centrist uh, people, um, they were um, um, defeated uh, by, by, by the old traditional right. Um, there was a coalition around uh, Maréchal Pétain, who collaborated uh, with the Germans and um, um, after the uh, attack of, of Germany uh, against France, um, they, uh, they worked with the Germans, they persecuted uh, Jews, um, sometimes uh, without uh, being forced by, by the Nazis. Um, so there was um, some, some indigenous <laughs> anti-Semitism in, in that um, um, right-wing uh, government, which, um, which led to many uh, thousands of Jews uh, being sent to concentration camps and being murdered. And, uh, and so um, there was that strand of right-wing Catholic anti-Semitism, which was finally totally discredited um, during um, the Second World War. And um, right after the war, um, those people were totally kind of um, uh, uh, discredited as uh, respected uh, figures uh, of, of the public. 
and um, they played no real public role anymore. Uh, during the 60s, I mean, we had uh, the May re revolution of the students and uh, we had the rise of um, left-wing um, Jews like Daniel Kuhn-Bendit. And so uh, for many years, it was um, really very, very clear that anti-Semitism had no place in, in the French public sphere. And still that changed over the last few years. And, um, and that's very interesting and again, very surprising because um, we had all thought that this is just dead. And, um, but it seems uh, the situation is a bit more complex than that. And, um, and uh, one thing, of course, which, um, uh, which showed that um, anti-Semitism was still around was um, the slow but gradual rise of the far right since the 70s, um, which was um, uh, led by, by family, which is still led by family, um, Le Pen, uh, the father, and then Le Pen, the daughter. Uh, what they called uh, Rassemblement National. At the time, it was Front National. And, um, and so that is a party where anti-Semitism is important um, as part of the identity. Um, there were these um, horrible comparisons um, that, um, I mean, Le Pen, the father, said that um, perhaps we need another oven for, for the Jews or something. And um, so um, there were these occasional slurs and um, anti-Semitic hate speech, incidents of hate speech um, um, in, in, um, in Front National. Um, it was uh, something which is, I think, I don't think they really ran a campaign which was anti-Semitic. Um, it was basically uh, something that they believed in. They believed Jewish people to be traitors and not trustworthy and things like that. Um, but I don't think that Front National is um, as openly anti-Jewish as uh, the Nazi um, movement in Germany, for example, or what happened before in, in, in the Second World War. World War. And um, and so um, there was this kind of um, um, safe space for anti-Semites, let's say say like that, um, in Rassemblement National. And um, and at the same time, over the last five years or so, um, there has been a rise of incidents um, uh, of violence against Jews. Um, and. Um, and uh, there, for example, um, uh, most uh, well known, the, um, the attacks against Jews in 2015, there was a number of terrorist attacks. Um, there was uh, the Bataclan attack. Um, that was um, um, a raid of um, Islamist um, terrorists uh, from the suburbs, um, from French uh, immigrant children. Um, against people uh, having a party um, in, in the Bataclan club. And, um, and they were mm -hmm. uh, indiscriminately uh, killing people, including Jews. And they were also uh, persecuting some Jews, uh, which they um, uh, disliked especially, it seems. So there was uh, two days after the Charlie Hebdo massacre, which was in the same year, um, there was um, a massacre of four Jews um, in the Iber Marché. Uh, there was um, in Paris, in, in, I think in the 11th or the 20th uh, arrondissement, there was an attack on, on Jews. So ever since um, um, the question of anti-Semitism is back um, with very violent attacks against um, some Jews, um, and people have been wondering to what degree uh, this has been supported um, by public discourses about Jews. Okay, let me just have a quick look at uh, the chat because I can't talk and read at the same time. Yeah, thanks for those points. Um, I totally agree and um, 
that's exactly the type of uh, reflection uh, we need to um, to engage in. Um, so let me uh, continue with um, with the debate with France, and I think there are two things which are new, which have um, fed uh, those um, incidents of anti-Semitic violence. And um, um, there's, on the one hand, um, uh, there's um, a kind of tense relationship between um, the populist leftists uh, like um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who was um, a presidential candidate in the election of 2012 and also 2017. 2017 was the election when Macron was finally elected. In 2012, um, Mélenchon ran on, on a decisively um, leftist platform. He, um, he did well, but he was um, not able to, um, to overtake um, um, the social democrat, the socialist, which is uh, François Hollande. Who, um, who won finally against um, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. And, um, and at the time, Mélenchon was still the kind of ex-socialist, uh, become, having become a leftist and, um, and uh, a very good orator, um, a very good kind of uh, innovative um, political thinker, also a very kind of ego-driven uh, personality, perhaps. And... Um, and what was interesting in the campaign of 2017, um, he he changed a bit. I mean, one thing is that that he no longer was explicitly uh, committed to the left right wing uh, binary, even though I mean he was definitely uh, the preferred choice by um, by uh, many of the far left uh, uh, militants. He was able to um, to get votes uh, from ex communist voters and. Um, um, the uh, the broad area of uh, leftists, but he also reached out to um, to people who did not uh, explicitly see themselves as um, as leftists, and um, you could see a certain accent um, on the nation. Um, you didn't see the word left anymore um, on on his um, um, on his posters in his campaign. So there was a certain um, populist um, shift in his discourse towards um, the national community, uh, away from kind of class struggle in, towards uh, the, the national community. And um, there was also, and that was perhaps something even older than that, um, some incidents um, about him saying something about um, the French political class um, being dominated and led by uh, by the rabbis or by by the Jewish representat representatives um, uh, uh, in France, so um, which led to him being excluded um, from being invited uh, by um, what's it called? I think the CRIF, uh, which is the uh, the Jewish representation uh, in political life in France, and so. Um, uh, Mélenchon, just like Corbyn, has not been popular um, among uh, Jewish activists, and um, and many people in in the Jewish community have been quite critical of um, the way that he um, that he talks about uh, uh, about the Jewish community, and um, there there are similar kind of discourses about Israel, uh, about um, taking the side of uh, the Palestinians and joining the post-colonial struggles which um, left um, some um, uh, who, 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 who support the Jewish um, cause um, a bit um, uh, speechless and a bit um, uh, uh, concerned about um, that kind of discourse. So what we see in, in France, a bit like in the UK, uh, we have um, a split of a classic uh, left-right um, spectrum um, there, there's the growing importance of the um, uh, radical fringes, of the populist fringes. Um, on the one hand, there's uh, Le Pen, Rassemblement, Rassemblement National. On the other hand, there's um, uh, people like Mélenchon and some others. Um, he's not the only one of, um, 
the kind of populist um, left. Um, he's perhaps less left in his uh, rhetorics and his ideology than some of the other uh, far left um, Gauchista um, um, uh, politicians. And uh, in the middle, you have centrist uh, left leaning and right wing leaning po politicians who, um, who never had that kind of controversies over their stance um, towards the Jewish community. And, um, and, um, and we also need to, to, to say that uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, who um, uh, has really contributed to radicalizing the um, traditional conservatives towards the right, he's been extremely consistent in defending um, the Jews against uh, attacks. Um, and he, he has been a very kind of um, uh, conscious, um, um, has been very conscious of, of that problem. And uh, I'm not aware of, of him really kind of um, contributing um, to hate speech against, uh, against Jews. Um, and um, the same thing, of course, for the centrist um, socialists. Um, there's, I'm not aware of, um, of major incidents um, of anti-Semitism um, in, in their ranks. So, um, yeah, we've, we've got that kind of uh, split, which is a bit like, um, like the one in, um, in, um, in the UK. And uh, perhaps um, there's a longer kind of um, subterranean um, discourse against Jews um, on the right. Um, there's a long tradition of bourgeois Catholicism in France, which we don't have, of course, in the UK. And, um, and so there's this kind of, um, kind of um, subterranean um, anti-Jewish feeling, which was never really kind of very visible, um, but um, which has become more visible through um, uh, Le Pen. And, um, and also through um, the kind of controversies um, on the left um, around um, how to talk about Israel and uh, about um, how to deal with, um, uh, with uh, attacks against Jews, uh, especially since 2015. And there's one more thing which has really kind of troubled many people, and that is um, the rise of anti-Semitic talk and discourse um, in immigrant populations. And um, what is quite clear is that um, the incidents of um, violence against uh, Jews in Paris and um, some other uh, cities, almost all of them have come from immigrant children, that is um, from children with a Muslim background um, from North Africa. And um, I mean, in, in most cases, uh, they were born in France and they are French, um, but they have um, a background of, um, of um, a second or third generation immigration living in the outskirts. Um, and that was certainly the case for those who came to attack the Battle Clan, um, the club in, in the 11th um, in, in Paris. And, um, and so uh, we realized that over the last few years, um, in, in these young um, immigrant um, um, uh, milieus, there's a festering kind of discourse against, um, against Jews. And, um, and in, in some, in few cases, this has led to very um, violent um, attacks against uh, Jews in France. And, um, and of course, this is a third line of anti-Semitic discourse or anti-Semitism. So the classic one, the historic one is of course, uh, bourgeois Catholicism in France. Um, the second one is the post-colonial left, uh, leftist discourse against Israel, um, which sometimes gets tangled up in these anti-Semitic discourses. And, um, and then we also have these, um, immigrant discourses um, uh, in, in kind of Muslim background um, populations in the outskirts. And, um, and the second and the third discourse, they sometimes they go together. And perhaps um, the kind of um, 
uh, immigrant um, anti-Semitism um, that it's sometimes used by Le Pen to um, to say that well um, well have a look at um, at, uh, at at those Muslims they're violent uh, so um, in a way uh, this has probably pushed some of the old guard in in, in, in the right wing traditional um, uh, bourgeois um, um, uh, groups towards um, taking the, uh, the case, um, taking the side of, of, of Jews um, and um, of perhaps of Israel. And um, it's perhaps no, no in the coincidence that Sarkozy um, is very much a pro-Israel. And whereas there has been some sort of alignment among some leftist factions and um, and the immigrant uh, discourses uh, around uh, uh, Jews. So this is a quite new phenomenon, and um, it has been difficult to react to that because um, um, there are all kinds of discourses of victimization that go together. Because of course, um, Muslim immigrants um, they speak as victims of um, of global um, exploitation, right? Um, and um, and if they, if they talk um, against Jews, it's with the idea that uh, Israel is an imperialist power, right? So it's, it's kind of close in a way to, to leftist discourses about Israel. And, um, and that makes it uh, difficult to deal with because um, uh, all these participants of discourse, they um, they had these imaginaries about um, um, a global world system of uh, the dominant and the dominated, and um, and uh, these discourses are really fed by um, by ideas of victim victimization of um, of um, uh, those who um, who are the, the the victims of capitalism of the world system, and um, in some cases. Uh, these things are turned against um, against some groups and some people, and sometimes um, even some people are killed for that, which is um, uh, which is um, uh, I mean really kind of uh, very much concerning. Yeah, so these are a few things about um, uh, the two countries, uh, France and the UK. Let me have a look at um, at the uh, at the chat. Yeah, I'll get back to um, to the question uh, around Kosovo and Ulrich at the end. Um, let me say a few things about Germany. Um, and um, um, in Germany, of course, um, the debate around uh, anti-Semitism is a bit different. Um, in Germany, um, there's a very um, long and a very kind of uh, committed um, um, uh, fight against anti-Semitism, uh, which is very much uh, supported by, by all governments and, uh, and the state. Um, in Germany, I think in, in comparison to other European countries, I think the idea is that Germany in a way is a product of Auschwitz um, right together with Israel. So um, there's a very strong idea of um, of some um, link between Israel and uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, um, even though um, that depends on uh, probably observers, but that definitely exists um, among some um, some of observers in Germany. And um, at the same time, um, uh, there have been some incident incidents of um, of parties and groups trying to. Um, um, to exploit um, that topic. Um, and the one incident that comes to my mind is about 20 years ago, that was, I think, in 2002, there was a liberal politician called uh, Möllemann. i write it down, Möllemann. I mean, this is a historic historical figure now. I mean, you don't really hear about him anymore. Um, he uh, 
he produced um, a brochure, um, kind of um, um, about Jews being responsible for the Intifada, and um, and there were discourses around um, Germans not being allowed to say what they think, and, and uh, there was this kind of um, yeah a big big controversy about um about his role his way of talking about that issue and the special kind of um, um german experience um, uh, about um, um about dealing with uh, with uh, uh, anti-semitism after the war and um, um at some point there were some discourses around yeah well look at those uh, people in israel they're just like the nazis they um they occupy the west bank and um uh, they kill the palestinians and um isn't it like like i mean that's the kind of uh, discourses that you could see at some point um uh, in 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 that controversy but other than that uh, i'm not aware of a major um debate around um anti-Semitism. Uh, Möllemann, shortly after that debate was over, he left his party, he was made to leave, and um, he was too toxic for his own party, and he then died, um, probably by suicide, and um, and so there was no real kind of um, um, major kind of um, uh, debate around um, uh, anti-Semitism until a few weeks ago when there was this attack um, against a synagogue in Halle in the, in the eastern parts of Germany and um, uh, and that was um, something which is very kind of um, um, new because normally there were um, no public debates around um, acts of violence against um, Jewish uh, facilities even though um, there have been uh, lots of incidents which are usually not reported in the media uh, because of some special treatment um, uh, in order not to um, to stir up uh, violence and hatred. So um, there's a very clear um, consensus in the um, political classes um, to um, to side with um, Israel. There's, I think, even a, a decision by the Bundestag to to declare as anti-Semitic. The idea that Israel has no right to exist um, as a state, which um, which is uh, which is supported by uh, many people. However, there's one thing I think which um, I think is really important uh, when we talk about um, the debates around anti-Semitism in Germany, uh, and that's um, the phenomena which is called the anti-Germans. The anti-Germans is a faction of the German far left. Uh, the Antifa, which uh, as it is called in Germany, and um, and after the um, the first Iraq War uh, in 1992, um, there were very strong debates in the Antifa in, in the German far left around uh, whether it is okay to take the sides. Um, um, with um, uh, Iraq or Iran um, against um, Israel and um, so since the 90s there has been a very um, a very strong debate um, around uh, Israel in the in the German left and um, and I remember when I was um, uh, living in Magdeburg, which is in, in eastern Germany, I was active in the um, anti-globalization network attack, um, and I met uh, somebody coming from Hanover, and the first thing she said, "Oh, you're in attack. Are you anti-Semitic?" And I was really taken aback. That was shocking, and uh, I I just didn't understand at all what she meant, and um, and so then I understood over the years. I mean, um, she was part of the anti-Germans, which is a rather kind of um, theoretically informed, but also quite um, committed, um, morally committed um, movement um, in, um, in the German far left. And uh, the anti-Germans uh, have developed um, a systematic critique 
of um, what they call anti-Semitic tropes. And um, for them, the idea is, I mean, any discourse which in a way um, makes uh, people, specific people responsible for exploitation or problems which are really a problem of a system like capitalism and um, exploitation and globalization all that if that's the case if if, if people are made responsible that is really uh, something uh, problematic and that is um, a typical kind of mechanism in anti-semitic discourse where in a way um, um, people are blamed for um, the kind of systemic uh, problems in capitalism, which is exploitation. And then um, the kind of critique of the system is confounded with the critique of people, and that can sometimes lead um, to genocide. And uh, that's why um, they have taken um, um, a very radical pro-Israel critique into um, the German far left, and um, they've really started some sort of um, discursive civil war uh, within the far left uh, by really kind of um, making the point that um, um, that there are lots of implicit um, tropes and discourses in 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 in, in far left thinking which uh, should be reflected on and um, and there has been a very systematic critique of of all those ideas of the conspiracy of few capitalist holding all the resources, sucking the blood out of good Germans and things like that. Uh, that's, of course, um, a certain leftist discourse, which, um, which is important in, 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 in Germany as well, just in, like in the other countries. And so um, they have really kind of um, uh, made people aware of, of the dangers of, of those kind of um, discourses, which, um, which may lead to some sort of um, blatant racism and uh, the extinction of um, uh, projects uh, uh, geared towards the extinction of whole groups. And, um, and so the anti-Germans, um, they're usually not only very pro-Israel, they're also pro-American. And um, they, um, um, they are against those who are um, self-identified as the anti-imperialists. So the big split in, in, in Germany, in the far left, is between the anti-Germans and the anti-imperialists. Because, of course, for the others um, uh, who, um, who have been challenged by the anti-Germans, um, the point, of course, is to criticize um, global capitalist domination. And, um, and sometimes, um, uh, those discourses have um, gone hand in hand uh, with the critique of Israel and um, the kind of supposedly imperialist uh, approach of um, Israel in, um, 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 in, in in the West Bank and in the Middle East. So um, that is, I think, a development which has never taken place um, in the other two countries. Uh, there's no anti-German critique of um, within the left or kind of um, uh, kind of um, critique of, of kind of uh, dangerous conspiracy theories um, and uh, and that's why I think um, uh, anti-semitism as a new discourse as a kind of post-colonial discourse has made much further inroads in France and in the UK because in a way there's this kind of old uh, right-wing uh, anti-Semitism and now there's a lot of space given to to some people um, who are considered as um, anti-Jewish or at least anti-Israel um, on the left and that of course is a very dangerous uh, situation because it, um, it, it it takes down in a way the defenses um, uh, of, of of the Jews or those who 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 are aware of um, of the dynamics that um, that can 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 follow from 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 those debates um, and the consequences for for specific uh, people. So um, I think um, that's a big difference, and um, I I think that um, 
it would be great to have a European debate um, uh, within the left, uh, but also across um, across the camps um, around uh, around the question, uh, so that uh, the different um, choices and different reactions and uh, the different traditions um, can um, can be made explicit, and people become aware of. Um, of um, dynamics which uh, in in the great majority of cases they're not really um, 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 uh, in favor of i mean lots of these discourses they they work by themselves and um, uh, they can't really be traced back to to any specific intention or or any specific strategy so um, i think um, there's something that uh, that we can learn from each other and um, yeah um, that's basically um, my my um, uh, my overview of these uh, three countries and my ideas for for today. And um, uh, I I must say I've um, I've been touched by these things in in, in, in many ways. Uh, um, I, I I mentioned that um, I was asked whether I was anti-Semitic, which which I found shocking um, in in the two thousands. And which made me think about uh, about things. I mean, I still think that attack, which is no longer really existent, I don't think that it was um, anti-Semitic, uh, at least not in anything that that I saw in Germany. Um, when I was in France, um, I, I I I saw the um, the attacks against uh, the Battle Clan uh, from very very close by, and um, that was uh, deeply unsettling and, uh, and traumatizing. And um, and now I, I, I follow the, the Brexit discourse in the UK, which is um, a very difficult uh, debate. And I, I see that um, the major opposition party is uh, dragged down in, in discourses around uh, anti-Semitism. And um, that's, uh, that's hugely um, disappointing and um, hugely um, uh, difficult uh, because uh, of this very important political uh, situation and conjunction which we uh, live nowadays. So um, I think um, there's no way um, to get around these questions and um, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we talk to people and um, and bring these, um, um, make people conscious of um, what uh, what they say and what, uh, what might be the consequences of what they say without um, um, intending them. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, my idea for today. Um, let me go to to the um, chat um, should I go perhaps through some of the points that have been raised by the chat um, I see the question I think it came from Yuba um, the study by Kohlstrup and Ulrich um, the conflict dynamics are real conflicts and not generalized hostility towards Jews. Um, I don't really understand the question precisely. I mean, there are all kinds of factors which um, explain why certain groups are made responsible for certain social problems. And um, it certainly um, has some real factors. I mean, the economy always plays a role, um, even though I would never reduce these things like racism and anti-Semitism to just a, an economic question. That would be, I think, quite, um, quite problematic to do but so. So I would say um, um, that the whole discourse today about uh, inequality, it certainly has to do something with um, with the extreme inequality that that we, that we can observe between um, um, the many uh, who um, haven't really been doing well and uh, the few who whose fortune has exploded over the last few years, and uh, that of course creates um, identity conflicts and makes them much worse than they would have to be, because I think these identity discourses are so important. Um, because identity is something that gives recognition and um, value to people 
and this is a discursive value that's not only um, an economic value and and we need to be we want to be recognized and acknowledged as as good um, social beings and as good members of our communities and so if people have the impression that they're no longer recognized or that there's a risk of uh, being kind of devalued um, people sometimes react quite strongly and uh, lots of the kind of anti-immigrant um, discourses is really about that uh, people being kind of um, threatened uh, in their identity um, about um, the hierarchy that they take for granted between them being perhaps um, at a, a certain place and then losing that and um, and kind of um, accepting others being perhaps um, on an equal footing or higher or lower or whatever. So there's this kind of imaginary competition between groups and uh, identities much about that. And so I would say that um, there are also always real conflicts. Um, if, if a real conflict is, for example, an economic uh, conflict between um, uh, classes um, and uh, the cultural identity things, which are also very important, they all go together. So I wouldn't really um, separate um, the real and the discursive conflict, if that's uh, really the question. And, um, and in fact, I think uh, one thing that we should pro probably, I mean, uh, say, I mean, I would think, uh, but I'm not an expert and um, there are other th people who know much more about that. I don't think um, that the current rise of anti-Semitism can be really um, traced back to some sort of psychological disposition of people being against Jews. I don't think that this really drives many people. Um, it certainly drove um, the historic right-wing anti-Semites uh, from Richard Wagner to Hitler to um, to the British Nationalist Party to um, to Le Pen, right? Um, they they definitely had this kind of idea that Jews are um, inferior, and um, they shouldn't have the same kind of place and recognition in Europe, uh, which is um, kind of white uh, Christian uh, Europe. Um, but I think this is rather kind of um, uh, decreasing that kind of idea, and um, I guess. Um, uh, today's tendencies, they're more about um, ideas of victimhood, ideas of having one's place and one's recognized place in a global world where there are huge inequalities and um, where there's a certain kind of um, conspiracy theory um, which is very easily uh, connected with Israel and Jews. So um, in order to rationalize um, uh, inequality and also the fight against inequality and the fight for social justice, um, people have recourse to, to those conspiracy theories which are easily anti-Semitic, even though this is not the primary um, um, drive. That's, that's what I would suspect. Um, but of course, um, they are very different um, backgrounds. Personally, I I don't believe that people like Corbyn or Mélenchon personally have something against any Jews. Um, of course, I mean, if I say that, that's of course what I mean. Almost everybody who is seen as anti-Semites by other by some other people would say, right? So it doesn't really explain that much but um, I, I would certainly see a difference between the type of anti-semitic discourse um, that um, that that is supported by certain things in the Labour Party or in um, um, in Mélenchon uh, and uh, the classical uh, right-wing um, anti-semitism which is a very different thing I think and um, and I think it's Probably less personal, yeah. So it's not personal hostility uh, towards Jews that much, perhaps. Um, uh, 
I'm trying to see what else came up in, in the in, in the chat here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ahmed says it's really important not to to um, uh, to fall prey to to anecdotal evidence. It's very important to um, to have some serious research behind that. And um, and I guess there is serious research that there's a rise of anti-Semitism over the last five years. Um, there's some signals, some some. Um, surveys, some some statistics that show that there is a rise. Um, I mean, there's, for example, a rise of people emigrating from France to Israel. Now, whether this is really a response to anti an anti-Semitic climate, that's difficult to say. Um, also, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, there are not that many Jews in France, I guess, but. Um, we're talking about um, a few thousand people, but not many more people than there used to be. And that might be quite um, 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 disturbing. Um, and, uh, and of course, I think um, the problem with racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism is it's very, um, it touches emotions. And 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 as as a kind of non-specialist, I, I would say uh, I would always be very careful uh, when people uh, get into that kind of exciting kind of obsessive discourse, um, and that always makes me uh, kind of very skeptical and kind of uh, critical. And uh, what I see, for example, is this kind of obsessive kind of um, expression in the face, and when people start to talk about Israel. And this doesn't happen when they talk about France or about um, Algeria or about um, Mongolia. So um, you see that kind of effective kind of dimension, uh, which I think uh, should be uh, an indication for there being something, something so that people need to be calm and kind of rational and talk about that. Um, and kind of um, compare, um, I mean, why are they so obsessed with things that the Israeli state has done and there's no debate about um, uh, things uh, in other um, countries? I mean, this is not to relativize anything, but just understand why there's a structure of discourse obsession uh, with certain things and not with others. and. Um, and that's something I think where people should really kind of um, try to to kind of be reflective about their own obsessions. And I have um, these affective reactions to some things and not to others. I think that's very human, very normal. And I guess that it's important to um, um, to see that as a kind of um, um, signal that that there's something which is not just um, uh, a normal criticism of Israel. Um, it is there's something more behind it um, that uh, that we need to understand, and so that uh, we can um, have a serious debate on what is wrong and not so good, and perhaps good um, in 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 how Israel has um, uh, has done the settlement policy, for example, and things like that. And um, yeah. And um, maybe it does relate to the history where Jews are perceived to be unhomey, whilst France and Algerian colonial relations were purely colonial, and France had already a home country in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Are there any other points that um, you'd like to discuss, or reactions, or? Um, ideas.
Okay, um, have I responded to the questions? I've, um, I'm not sure I understood everything. Um, if you want, we can, of course, uh, continue the debate um, uh, outside, just send me an email or whatever. Perhaps uh, there's another occasion. I think this is a quite interesting format and um, interesting way to, to, to think about these uh, questions that, that touch us. And um, so, um, yeah, if there's no other points, uh, I think maybe um, it's time to um, to finish. Okay, I see there's some more reactions here from Ahmed and Suley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, and of course, anti Semitism is not not just about religion or culture. Um, it's, um, I think it's really about um, the boundaries that are drawn to make some people belong to our crowd and to make sure that other people are outside. And anti-Semitism, of course, is a special device um, that allows people to make boundaries. Um, it is a special device because um, in many cases, racism is against um, people who are seen as inferior. Whereas in, in the case of anti-Semitism, it is uh, a device that creates a boundary towards people that are seen as, I mean, imaginary this is right right this is just the kind of discourse imagery um so it's it's much more about people who are seen as um, superior and um so they're sometimes I mean, mostly seen as white um kind of well-educated rich um and so um i guess that anti-semitism is close to racism but it's not the same thing it's perhaps an inverse racism i don't know Okay, good. So thanks a lot to Ira for organizing that. It's been a pleasure and um, and perhaps see you some someday again. Bye.